Okay, we're going to start. Welcome to Cindy and Kevin and Kim Cherie, who just got lost, but hopefully will be back with us today. Uh, I'm going to start by having our presenters today introduce themselves uh, and talk a little bit about why we chose this title, Programming Without Fear, and we're going to launch in. Um, Anthony, why don't you start? Hi, uh, my name is Anthony Cabrera. I am the assistant conductor of the Gaiman's Chorus of South Florida and the conductor of their chamber ensemble, Tropical Wave. And I also sit on the New Harmony Task Force, happily doing that. And Waigua. Hi, my name is Kimberly Waigua. I'm the artistic director for One Voice Mix Chorus in Minnesota. And Kathleen. Hey there, Kathleen Hansen. I direct the San Diego Women's Chorus in San Diego, and I'm the 411 Artistic Advisor here for Gala. And I am Jane Ramsire Miller, and I serve as Gala's Artistic Director and am planning this festival that's coming up. Just so you know, the, the slides that we're going to use tonight and most of the information that we're talking about is already posted as of yesterday on the GALA website. So take notes if you want to, but I think most of the resources are going to be there for you after we're done. And I'll put that link uh, in the chat as we're moving forward here. I'm gonna share my screen just to um, let you see the guidelines that GALA has come up with for this festival. And, um, you, uh, and then Kathleen is gonna take it away here. Awesome. Um, as mentioned, this is a, reprise of a co same conversation we had earlier, but we are recording this for posterity. So think of some good questions. Um, we have come up with these guidelines as part of a bigger picture in GALA courses to really take deeper dives regularly into the ideas of equity, access, and belonging. Um, we found that in our own festivals and in other choral festivals around the world and the country, that conversations about what to sing, how to sing it, why to sing it, um, come up in various contexts. And we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is um, expansive and ethical and with great thought. So we found over the years that when we talk about singing music, especially music of a culture that's not necessarily the default mainstream culture of any given chorus, um, that either we're afraid to do it and we avoid it altogether because we're afraid to do it wrong, or we do it and maybe we haven't really done our homework and it doesn't come across the way we intend it to. So we'll have a pretty uh, good conversation around all of those things today and we have it kind of split up so that it, it turns into bite-sized conversations for all of us. I will say that um, the GALA website has a page for um, performance guidelines in general. And it does include kind of these specific things that we're talking about today, which relate to um, culture and performance practices and repertoire selection. On that page, there's also information about logistics and aesthetics and performance, um, big, big picture performance things in addition to what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Shall I jump right into the um, tools for programming? Or actually, I think Waigua has a few more yeah. introductory. Yeah, so just before we dive into those guidelines, um, I just wanted to kind of help us contextualize um, why it is we have kind of these programming guidelines. Um, and so that's sort of just acknowledging the existence of the global majority. Um, and so the global majority is um, an American term. Uh, it's used in, in the UK as well. But it's to represent um, essentially Black people, Indigenous people, Brown people, Latinx people, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, Inuit and Alaskan peoples, the Natives, Native Americans, Arabs, Western Asia. Asian and Middle Eastern, um, people with dark skin, North Africans, Southeast Asians, South Asians, East Asians, all Asians, um, Africa, and then biracial and multiracial people because they make up the global majority, which is 85% of the population. And so 
we are very used to programming in that last 15%. And as gala choruses, we're not even programming from that 15% because a lot of us don't do as much sacred music and that sort of thing. So we're really pulling from a very, very small selection of music available to us. And especially as groups that are really focused on um, equity, access, and belonging, we need to make sure that we widen the scope of our view in terms of what is um, appropriate for us to be programming, what our repertoire is. Um, and in this, we'll be kind of fa facing the challenges that we might have with people who don't feel like they can represent other people's stories or that they shouldn't, or it's a barrier between them and the audience, um, or fearful of, um, Anthony will explain this very well later, appreciation and appropriation, and just scared of doing it wrong and, and creating barriers. Uh, from ourselves in being able to access other cultures and other languages and just sort of delve into humanity more deeply. So that's kind of the framework that we're operating on as we dive into these guidelines. That was so well said. Um, so we have kind of a, a list here of things to consider and we'll go through it with you step by step. And the first is when we're programming music from a culture that is not as familiar to the core of each organization, we like to ask, why are you selecting this particular song? How does it honor the culture in which it was created? And secondly, how will you as the, you as the director, as well as your chorus, devote time to learning about the culture and context of this music? I know that uh, many of us have probably fallen into picking a piece that sounds good, sounds cool, yay, let's do it. And we jump into notes and words and uh, don't necessarily always go as deep as we like to, or as we maybe should in both our own research and with our chorus. And we really hope that this will be giving some empowering ideas um, for one another. We also want to seek out and purchase music composed and arranged by individuals who are rooted in the culture. Um, at very least, we want to find music arranged or composed by folks who have a connection, who've studied and understand the culture from which they are writing I or um, teaching. One of the examples that I have is that one of my professors, uh, she is a white American woman, but she spent many, many years living in Africa, studying under a, a teacher who said, please learn all of this music. And when you go back, I would love it if you shared it with everyone. I want, we really want folks to, to learn this. But with that comes a great deal of responsibility to keep that ethical and explain this is where it came from. These are the performance practices. This is how we can honor the music. We'll talk more about that as we go. But that goes down into number three here, plan your score and rehearsal preparation with diligence and over to Waigua for more on that. Yeah, so kind of what uh, Kathleen was saying before is it's important to know not only what notes are on the page and what dynamics and articulations and things that you're gonna need from the chorus, but to also be curious to dig deeper than what you see on a page uh, and to understand if that is a rendering that you're seeing on the page of something that wasn't necessarily made for a page but is being made accessible to you um, or digging into more than the language on the page. Um, be curious about the culture. Where does this language come from? How does this language function in whatever culture it comes from? Um, what stories can accompany this? Was it written for a specific purpose? Does it fall into this specific tribe that uses this for, you know, whatever it is? Um, is it the product of colonization? Is it for celebration? Is it about peace? Is it for building community? What is the piece of music for? And then understanding the subtext, again, going deeper, reading between the lines of how well can you understand the language if you don't dig into the language um, and are seeing it from the lens of the language that you know and a translation. Um, and does the piece convey um, something that moves beyond just fitting a concert theme or selecting a piece to, to check off a box? Does this piece truly fit within the message you're trying to convey in your concert or the collection of pieces that you like to see in your concert? 
Um, and then what role would this piece play in the original context? Does that fit the same role in, in addition to fitting whatever your theme may be? So prepare, preparation, preparation, preparation. You're muted. So in terms of addressing appreciation versus appropriation, I think appropriation has been our fear for a long time. And, and there's a lot of shame in that and wanting to avoid that concept of appropriation. But, you know, it, it takes an understanding of what appreciation is. The perfect example is the culinary world. Greatest restaurants in the world uh, usually offer fusion menus combinations of food from other cultures and they don't seem to have that fear that we do uh around performing pieces of music um from other cultures uh, and and we kind of in conversation came up with the with the concept that the difference between appropriation and appreciation is whether or not you're approaching the music through a default right is that is your presentation of music the default? Is this what is it what you always expect? Um, so, what is the context in, in in which you're using the music? You know, how does it fit into the program? Uh, if you're using a, a piece in Hebrew simply because you need to fill a Hanukkah check a Hanukkah box in in your holiday program or your December concert, you know. What, what really is the intent of that piece of music? If it's not connected to Hanukkah or fit in, in, in the program in some way thematically, then it's appropriation, right? Uh, so make sure that it's always in context. And then don't just consider your, your performance practices, but you know the staging of your ensemble, your vocal production. Is this a song that's supposed to be sung in the round? Is it part of a of a community celebration where people face each other. It's the one where you take it into the audience and surround the audience because that's the context it should be performed in, right? So you have to take into account all of these other uh, aspects of it. Um, attire, costuming, that's, that's a dangerous one. Uh, the, uh, an example I, I shared earlier today is a fraternity was doing uh, one of those Cinco de Drinco parties, right? And a number of the, the students showed up wearing Mexican hat, uh, Mexican sombreros and ponchos. And that alone would be enough to raise more than the two eyebrows I have on my forehead. But paired with that were people dressed in maids, uniforms, and construction worker outfits, right? That implies way more than 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 even the use of the hat might. So the question then is, when you're presenting a piece of music and it doesn't feel right, it feels like you may bo be bordering on appreciation, then it's to answer the question, what is the wrong making feature? What about this potential, this approach that I'm taking right now to a piece of music is what's wrong? Uh, and what it, it is it, that it's going to imply and then address it. So uh, ultimately it's about really digging in and finding the appropriate context for a piece of music and presenting it as close to authentically as we can being outside of, of the, the culture bearing group that uh, yeah. that has presented this music. And then consider whether the repertoire choice might disrespect or trivialize a particular community, right? Sometimes the default is I need a holiday song and there's a really funny one and, and it's the, the Hanukkah song. And it's always the Hanukkah song that's funny, right? That's trivializing the experience of the Jewish community for the sake of one, a laugh, and two, checking a box in a concert program. So always check the context of the piece and always check for your intent in including it in the program.
All right. Sort of following in the same vein, um, in order to kind of know where you're going wrong, you're going to have to make sure that you put in the time um, to understand when you're going wrong. Uh, and so this just, just, just means you must educate yourself as artistic director on all, on all points as best as you can. Um, and so the best way to do that is to reach out to folks um, who are part of the culture or the community that you are programming from. Uh, culture bearers. And so you can pretty much do this in two ways. One, you might have a member of your chorus who is of that culture and is willing to lend their history and their perspective and share aspects of their culture with you to better inform you and the chorus on how to perform this piece um, and all the back history that you might not get from the internet, say, which might give you a good history but not an understanding. Um, and the second is if you don't have a culture bearer is to find one and compensate them for their time. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll go to, to bringing someone in, um, but to talk about culture bearers in your chorus first um, is making sure that you support them, either whether it's emotionally or financially, if you are able. Um, there's a lot of labor involved in representing your culture and aiding the director and the chorus to representing your culture. Like one person or a group of people is not a monolith and does not represent the entirety of that culture. However, that is sort of the role that you have put someone in in asking that, which is not to say you should not ask, but it's just something that you should be aware of. It requires you to give a lot of yourself in return because um, sharing your culture and how you were raised and the values that were given to you by being raised in a culture mean a lot to someone. Um, and so in asking them to give that, you must you must rid yourself of a lot of assumptions and examine the ways in which you interact with the information that they're giving you so that you can understand it as fully as possible. Um, in terms of finding a culture bearer, this may depend on where you live and what kind of piece you're doing. You might be able to just drive down the road, you know, <laughs> your friend's house. You know, you have someone who's, I don't know, whatever community it is that you can ask and who can connect you. Um, but you also might have to do a bit of Googling who's doing presentations on this. Who do you know who might know that person and doing doing the research to find someone um, and then compensating them for being willing to take their time and to share that with you to someone who is essentially probably a stranger um, in this. And then secondly, um, making sure that you understand that it's your responsibility to educate yourself, the chorus, and the audience. And there are multiple ways to do that, right? You can delegate this out and make it a chorus event. Uh, you can do it just through you and a culture bearer. You can do this in a variety of ways, but making sure that at the end of the day, when you put people on stage, um, that you're bringing their humanity as well as your own onto the stage and that your intentions are with appreciation um, as you analyze aspects of their culture and try to weave that in to the chorus. And the most important thing to remember in all of that is that repertoire can always wait. If you really want to put it in a concert, but you don't have the time to do it, don't do it. There will always be a piece that you are familiar with that you can slot into that, that the chorus might know. There's always an alternative. Um, and so take the time to make sure that you can educate all forces that are necessary and take all the time you need for information to sink in because you get information you have to process it. And then there's always like three months down the road where you're like, oh, <laughs> and real awareness starts to creep in. Uh, so give yourself the time and don't try to rush that process. So here's a here's a here's a tough one, right? Because uh, sometimes even tone production. Uh, is something that, that that when we try to emulate, we kind of cross the fine line uh, into appropriation, but as much as possible and with the potential assistance of culture bearers, uh, you focus on tone production and, and uh, vowel shapes and the way things are articulated in phrases and expression. Um, focus on that 
with, with the aim of making it as close to we poss- to to what you possibly can. I mean, obviously, we mentioned uh, earlier in the day that to make it purely authentic is impossible because it's not ours. Our goal is to get as close to it so that we can honor it, right? And understanding the context we have written there, not every West African song is intended to be accompanied by a drum or to use, uh, you know, movement or clapping. The drum and the movement and the clapping may be the default, and that's where we kind of stray into the appropriation world, right? Not everybody, not every Hispanic community uses ole or ay 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 as expressions of joy and approval. That's my world, right? I'm 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 of Cuban descent, right? We don't say ay 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 unless somebody, something hurts, right? That's our equivalent to ouch, right? Uh, so so understanding that right that that uh, it, the the variety of cultures within Hispan- within the hispanic world uh understanding that is essential uh other things to consider is it appropriate to add harmony to a song that's intended for unison singing if it's intended for unison singing don't be proud sing it in unison uh sometimes i i find it far more difficult to do that beautifully uh, and with the kinds of sounds that we like to hear, uh, then then singing in parts that hides a multitude of sins, right? But if it's, if, it's, if a dog if a, if if a song is intended to be sung in unison, then do that. Do it as it is intended. And then. Um... Another thing is to think to think of is to examine the assumptions that you have of different choral genres. I think uh, just as being a good musician, uh, you should have a basic understanding of historical movements and a historical timeline of musical movements um, and understanding what has affected what over the history of musical evolution. And then also what has been written down and recorded and what has not is also something that's important. So some things you might want to consider is what is idiomatic and what is non-idiomatic. So idiomatic is just something that's attributed to an indigenous or cultural um, place. So the spiritual um, would be um, an idiomatic uh, piece of music. Something like um, Nathaniel Death's Ave Maria or Chariot Jubilee would be non-idiomatic, where they're taking elements of black culture, but it's essentially in a classical Western frame. Um, Another thing that you can think of um, is what we think of as Western European music, Um, especially in South America um, and lots of places in Africa, there's been a lot of colonization and that has changed both um, composers that wouldn't necessarily be recognized with it if they didn't fit in that classical frame, as well as people who wrote within that classical frame. So as an example, you can think of um, uh, Ramirez's uh, Misa Crioja, which is um, this um, Brazilian, um, or sorry, Argentinian um, mass. And essentially all of the mass movements, um, Kyrie, Gloria, credo, so on, so on and so forth. It's outlining a regular mass. However, each of the movements are based on the kind of interplay between gaucho, nomadic mestizo, and like the Creole people of that area. So it's intentionally people who lived within the world of the indigenous and the colonizers. Um, and it's, it marries all of this together. And that's important for your understanding of performing the piece. Um, and knowing that the recording of it will never be accurate because they will put in things that might not be there because of their historical knowledge of whatever these dances are and what these people would have played. Um, Another way that you can think about this is if you're doing a big Broadway show, is there any schmaltzy Yiddish music in there, which is the foundation of a lot of Broadway? We need to make sure that that kind of art song would be covered, understanding just where uh, musical aspects intersect as long as we're, and also where history intersects. And then one last thing you can think about um, is thinking about um, diversity and underrepresentation through time. 
where we're really good at like the Fanny Mendelssohn's and the Clara Schumann's and that kind of stuff. But there's a whole history of um, women nuns um, who composed a ton of music in the Renaissance all the way up to Amy Beach and like the modern composers we know now. There's been, um, or like, um, what's his name? Uh, Jose Mauricio Nunez Garcia. He is like um, a Brazilian composer who wrote a little bit in the style of uh, Mozart in that classical era. There's a lot of underrepresentation kind of tucked into what we think of as Western classical music. So making sure you understand where these people are coming from, what you definitely know about the piece and what you definitely might not. All right, and then the next step will be, this is kind of continuing from the idea of having a culture bearer or reaching out to one, is that you might have the community um, of which you're singing pieces by uh, near you, accessible to you. Um, and so as a director, um, to definitely reach out to this community or these people, whether it's um, a specific community event, um, that is hosted by the community or one that is open to the public and see if you um, if you or if singers can visit this community and interact with this community. Um, however, you need to be very careful in doing this um, because you might not always uh, be welcome in a space like this. You're asking a lot, particularly if it's by invitation, um, or something that is not an event open to the public. Um, it is not a different culture's duty to educate you. So to put just strict parameters or to discuss them at least with any event coordinators of what level of interaction that you can anticipate, how much um, interaction that community might want with singers, what questions, any sort of participation, to just make sure you have a baseline of what to expect. And so, um, Conversely, also being able to communicate that to your singers and it kind of get them out of a frame of thinking of whatever community you've cultivated in the chorus to embracing a separate community. So that's assumptions some people might make, any standards they have for behaviors or actions, um, and knowing that you might go in and have a great time. They might be like, no, come, share my bed, let's sing. <laughs> <laughs> and do everything. Or you might have people that say, no, this is not the space for you. Um, and, and you have to kind of be willing to accept all levels in between. That reminds me that when we're working in collaborations, just how important it is to approach with humility and curiosity and a collaborative spirit so that we don't walk in with expectations like, this is what I want from you. More of how can we work together? How can I learn? Um, and we don't know what we don't know. And that brings us to um, being intentional about who is on stage. I think I got lost in the numbers here, Waigua. Did you have one more thing? Um, I think I covered that before the slide changed. So I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Jane's having a little trouble with the uh, slideshow today. <laughs> we're good. We're working. Sorry indeed. about that. It, whatever. The buttons oh. aren't working. Okay, take it away, Kathleen. Everything is good. Uh, we just wanted to talk about being intentional about who is featured on a stage. So if we're going to, we've chosen the music, we've done the work, then who are we inviting to, to perform with us or to speak with us or to set up the stage and, and tell stories um, so that we're creating an authentic situation. And we're continuing to, um, like Wawa said, explore who is underrepresented, who we might want to invite to collaborate and whose voices we might want to amplify as we explore different types of um, music and cultures. That ties into then educating the audience. So people who come to our audiences generally don't want to come um, attend a lecture, but they might want to come to a Q&A ahead of time. Um, it's very easy to expand our program notes to include a QR code for folks who want to go a little bit deeper to tell brief and engaging stories from the stage. 
um, maybe to put up a visual component that um, can expand the things that we're saying and singing about. Um, and of course, having question and answers, um, especially when we do something that is different for our audiences, they want to know where did this come from and to dispel any discomfort about is it is it okay that that they're doing this music we say here's the here's the work that we've done in order to get to this place that we can present this for you and then of course um, we want to be creative on um, remuneration and giving credit where credit is due so something came up um, earlier about how even our our copyright laws are somewhat colonized um, and if we're performing something that is technically in the public domain, because uh, it's a folk song from somewhere, how can we still give back to the communities from where that came or to the culture bearers who are helping us navigate all of that? Okay, thank you all. Uh, we're gonna spend a little bit of time just sharing uh, what we consider challenges in doing this work. And then we'll open it up for a Q and A for all, um, all of you. So uh, I invite you to put in the chat, what kinds of things do you find most challenging in uh, approaching this topic and approaching this kind of music? And I'm gonna start by saying, growing up, because that is something that I'm always afraid of uh, as a conductor. Um, it feels really important to me to do this work and it's, um, yeah. It's, it's hard to screw up and it's inevitable. And um, I'm, I learn how to do that with grace. Yeah, Kathleen, making mistakes. What other kinds of things uh, do you find a challenge? Offending others, yep, Cindy. I think this was something that I've encountered um, before and recently um, that kind of deals with what Cindy's talking about is sort of like the marginalization game it's sort of like we decide who is most marginalized at any given time. And that's kind of like a toxic lens at which to look through things like, is it trans and non-binary people? Is it black Americans? Is it Israelis? Is it now Palestinians? Like, is it really people in Venezuela? Is it really like the black people of South Africa? And we try to just like one up what suffering is rather than looking at the human aspects and understanding those as a way to authentically dig into repertoire. Um, and I think that's why there might be challenges to, oh, we can't do this, but we want to do this and we can't do this is because it feels like one is more valuable than the other for some reason, as though you can't do a piece of a different tradition in the same set or another concert. Um, or that suffering is like this singular human experience that only people who are in war-torn places can experience. Um, I watched a really good video of this burn survivor the other day in which he had had 75, 80% of his body burned and there had been someone in a bed next to him and had only 45. And that person who was at 45 just kept being like, well, you must have it so much worse. Um, and the guy with the more severe burns had said, is this the most excruciating pain you've ever experienced? Is this the loneliest you've ever been? Is this the saddest you've ever been? Is this the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to you? And he said, yes, like the, the person with less significant burns. Um, so the other guy was like, well, then this is the depths of your suffering. Um, and so understanding that the human experience doesn't just lie in very specific tragedies and nobody's tragedies are like, we shouldn't put them on a pedestal higher than anybody else's tragedies. Like, this is the human experience. Um, and so if you're approaching rep with trying to understand the human experience, then you can present it authentically because you're willing to dive in and understand what it's saying. I think another challenge as a conductor is just finding the time for the research and then committing the time in rehearsal to do the teaching and maybe even the time in the concert, right? Uh, it takes so much time and we are all so busy and many of us are part-time at the work that we do or underpaid or whatever. Um, and I think I think that's really important to make a determination about whether you actually have time to put in the, um, the research and um, do the education that's needed. Well, speaking to the time factor, I mean, I, 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 I always argue for delegating. <laughs> there will always be people 
within the organizations that will love to do this kind of work. So that if you are that underpaid uh, part-time artistic director that also has to pick music for church and public school, you know, there is someone within your organization or, or there will be a group of people within your organization that are willing to do this kind of work. I know that the organization that I work for, it's not someone on staff who does program notes. It's legit. Somebody who just loves that kind of research and will provide 75 pages of research that then have to be edited down into four lines. You know what I mean? So there will always be people who want to do this kind of work to help the chorus. That also makes uh, makes me think of that we don't need to like eat the whole elephant at once. We might choose <laughs> a a song, a connection to cultivate. Um, if we know that it's going to take, you know, twenty minutes every week to talk about Sylvie, we're probably not also going to do four other projects that season. We can pick in this one direction and expand ourselves and learn how to get better at what we're doing so that we can make really good choices about which things to undertake the next time. And in a similar vein, you can look at where you are and find something that is easily accessible to you, mm -hmm. people in your area, rather than finding something that, that might pull you musically at first, which takes you a little too far for the time that you have. That's great. But you know, in this conversation, I, I my brain keeps going back to the the biggest challenge being fear. But mm -hmm. Kathleen, you said something about you know telling, being able to tell other people's story, and my brain immediately goes to yet another art form, wherein we don't have a problem sharing other people's stories. We pick children's books from different cultures, and we share those with our preschools with love. You know, we eat food from different places mm. and people cook it and mix it and fuse it and they don't have a problem with it. But somehow we have this horrible, horrible, horrible hang up about feeling free to share other people's stories through song. Right. And, I, and then it's always that is you do if you do your due diligence. And if you really you bring your organization on board and you're doing this from a good place and you're not going to the default it shouldn't be a problem i'm going to share my screen again and just give you and again i will put this link in the uh, in the chat as we get near the end here but gala courses has a new website and a bunch of new resources on that website that i just want to share with you here and one of them is essentially the notes from this webinar on a page called Tools, uh, Tools for Programming Without Fear. So I encourage you to go back and review some of these notes that um, you have heard in this webinar and use this as a resource. There is also a link on this page to a new page called uh, Music from Composers Who Reflect Our Movement. So if you're struggling to figure out where do I start with um, more authentically accessible music from the global majority, there's a website, for example, called Musica International, which has thousands of pieces collected from um, cultures all across the globe. Uh, you just need to sign up to be a member of that organization and you have access to their in uh, their complete database. There are also links on this particular website for finding music by women composers, uh, independent composers, trans and non-binary composers, and uh, composers that represent our LGBTQI community. So check out that link and um, use it as a beginning resource for um, getting started with this kind of work and this kind of research. And finally, uh, Gala has a new, uh, it's called, just, we just call it our song database. It only right now has about 30 songs in it, but you'll see here in the screenshot that we're particularly looking for songs that have been performed by Gala Choruses 
that reflect our movement by in terms of composer, in terms of theme. So be sure to check out those particular pieces. They're really easy to search by theme, by um, type of chorus and uh, instrumentalists, um, voices, that sort of thing. And if you have songs that you feel like should be a part of this database, be sure to um, send those to me and I'll get them connected. All right. Thank you again for joining us. Huge, huge thank you to Anthony and Waigua and to Kathleen. Uh, and we're thrilled that you were able to join us tonight. We will put this recording up on the GALA website so that you can access it again and share it with anybody that might be interested.